Let's finish up our discussion on language development and theories of language today with this video. If we look at our objectives, we want to discuss Skinner's and Chomsky's contributions to the nature-nurture debate over how children, how children acquire language. We want to be able to explain why critical periods are an important concept in children's language development. If we're explaining language development, there are a couple of key theories that we want to look at. Um, these theories are somewhat controversial and probably work best when used together. First, we're going to look at a behaviorist perspective, and we're going to look at um, Skinner's perspective on language development. Skinner believed operant conditioning or operant learning was responsible for language development. Um, he believed that language was um, acquired partly from learning and imitating others. And there's some evidence to support this. There was a study that showed U.S. mothers were more likely than Japanese mothers, for example, to label and describe objects for toddlers. Those toddlers, in turn, were more likely than their Japanese counterparts to understand and say the object words. So parents are usually more concerned with what a child says than its form. Um, observations suggest that explicit reinforcement alone can't really explain the learning of syntax, however. So Skinner probably was right in some perspectives, but did not solve the, the explanation of language development alone. Um, and remember, adults typically don't give children grammar lessons, but they do modify their speech when talking to their uh, language learning children. They often shorten their sentences and use more concrete verbs and basic nouns, kind of like talking down to the child or using mother ease. And mother ease probably does not help children acquire language. Actually, studies seem to show that the more complex the mother's language, the earlier and more rapidly their children learn to speak in, in complex sentences. So modeling correct speech is important, especially if the child's giving approval for imitating that type of complex speech. But remember, conditioning can't explain children's development wholly. Okay, um, let's go ahead here to um, a second theory, a biological-based theory for language uh, acquisition. There are some researchers that argue that humans are pre-wired or biologically programmed to learn language. Um, Chomsky, in 1959, opposed Skinner's ideas. He basically thought that we, or as children, acquire language much too rapidly to explain it simply through learning principles. Chomsky believed that we had this built-in universal grammar device um, that allowed us to identify basic development or dimensions of language. Um, so our genetic predisposition probably does interact with experience, however, so both theories probably work best here. Some supporting evidence for Chomsky's um, theories could be that um, children often make up words uh, I want to go back here for a second. Uh, nope, backwards. Sorry. Children often make up words as they develop language using words like I goad to the store or I runded, um, which shows they understand rules and about past tense, and they probably have some similarity in their syntax development, but they, they probably don't, don't imitate those words from other adults. And there's evidence that most languages do show a similar syntax. Now, some people argue that the development of children's language is a reflection of their development of cognitive skills. So other cognitive skills are really to blame, I guess, or to give credit to, which is, doesn't support the biological basis. But there is some unique generating properties in the mouth and the throat and brain regions associated with language like Broca's area and Wernicke's area, which kind of states that humans are uniquely pre-wired to learn language. So um, we'll talk maybe about a critical period a little bit later um, and we'll move on here. So um, there's some statistic learning evidence and certainly some critical periods for development. 
and research shows well before our, our early birthday, our first birthday really at about the one word stage, um, our brains are able to discern word breaks in our native language, somehow statistically analyzing what syllables in an example like happy baby go together. And if people say happy bay and replace the, the B-Y and baby with uh, M-A, um, happy bay ma, that the brain f of, of those um, children find it very uh, distressing. So it seems like our brain is statistically analyzing um, language very early in our critical periods of development. So there's mommy talking with the baby there. Um, so if we look at genes and we kind of look at the whole picture, how does this fit together? Is it genetic? Is it pre-wired? Is it imitation and language? Um, if we look at the, the biopsychosocial model here, um, it probably explains things a little better that, that our genes do um, lay down um, the structure of our brain mechanisms for under, that understand language and produce language and trigger those um, language devices during critical periods. But our, our social, cultural language that we use provides input to those language devices. So it fine tunes. So kind of nature deals the cards, genetic deals the cards, but nurture plays the hand, and and our our cultural language does have an impact on that wiring. And of course, psychologically, our mastery of our native language and other languages plays a big role as well. There is some study, by the way, of um, bilingual studies that show uh, if bilingualism occurs before the end of that critical period, that those students seem to have better performance in both languages. I guess calling them balanced bilinguals would be um, a good term for that. And it does seem to facilitate academic achievement in other areas as well. So early immersion into bilingualism does seem to have a Im positive impact on development. And this critical period uh, to develop complex features of a second language, we really are better off if we're exposed to that second language earlier, as this graph shows. It's not that we can't learn a second language um, after, you know, age 17 or 18, but our fluency in that language is not as high as if we, we started that second language or another language um, before the age of seven. So immigrant children coming to a country, whatever country that is, are better off being immersed in that second language prior to the age of seven. But you notice it's sometimes a small dip. So by the age of, say, 12, we'll probably be 90% fluent, fluent in that lang second language. Um, and we can even learn a language well into our adulthood, just not as effectively if, if we were young. So what's the truth? Does thinking drive our language? Does language drive our thinking? Uh, they seem to be pretty intricately uh, intricately intertwined and if you practiced some things like imagine if you had to explain to someone what it's like to be really frustrated but I, I wouldn't let you use any words that began with the letter Z could you do it um, it's probably easy but try doing it out loud explain the last time you got frustrated but no words with the letter Z and that's it's I'm frustrated here, so it's probably pretty easy because I didn't restrict you that much. But what if we did something like this? Explain to someone what it's like to be really, really nervous, but you can't use any words with the letter T. So you can't say, well, I was pretty mad. No, I can't use pretty. I was really upset. To can't use upset. Um, if you did this for real out loud, even if nobody was there, it's almost impossible to do it smoothly and fluently because I've greatly restricted your vocabulary. Uh, I made it hard for you. This kind of backs the theory of linguistic determinism. Let's look at one more example. Um, how many of you have, uh, watching this video, have polar plunge with us? Could you explain to someone how cold the water feels? Or if you haven't polar plunged, do you think you could explain to somebody else how cold the water feels? It's hard to do because we don't have a lot of words to explain 
different variances of cold. Frigid, maybe, um, but it, it, it's certainly hard to do for people who've polar plunged. I've done it five times, and it's still really hard for me to explain to somebody it's really, really cold, other than it hurts a little bit. So does language influence thinking? Um, langu linguistic determinism suggests that your language does determine how you think. And Worf's hypothesis from 1956 suggests that language determines the way we think. Um, for example, um, the Hopi Indians, I believe, did not have past tense for verbs, so they could not really easily explain about the past. Imagine how hard that would be. And when a language provides words for objects or events, it's really easier to think about these more clearly and it's easier to remember them and explain them later. Uh, in one test, uh, researchers showed that it was easier to explain the difference between two colors in a, the example A because you could say one is well, one's kind of blue green and one's blue and then when they had subjects try to explain the difference between the colors in our B example it was harder because we didn't have special phrases we were limited by our language to explain the difference um, here what is that? Well, that's a dog, and we don't have to explain, well, it's an animal with four legs and fur, etc., etc. Just use the word dog, because we have the language um, to explain it, so it's easy. And it's probably easier to remember, too. Uh, another example that supports linguistic determinism was a, Br a Brazilian tribe whose language was studied, and they did not have a, a number, they could not define numbers of above two, and were unable to reliably tell the difference between piles of four or five objects or taps of a foot four, five, or six times. Known as the one-too-many language, tribe members could consistently match up one, two, or three objects. They had no problem. I put out three. They put out three. But as the number of objects grew that the researchers put out, the matching piles by the tribe members deviated more significantly the larger the numbers got. So if I put out 10, they may have put out 7 or 15 and, and basically stated that, that that was the same or they were very similar piles. So um, does language determine thinking? Well, to a large extent, it does. Uh, we do use that self-thinking when we think when we talk to ourselves. However, we also underestimate how often we think in images. Um, so, for example, when we turn on the hot water faucet, we don't uh, explain to ourselves what's going to happen in words. We basically imagine what it's going to feel like. Or when we're riding our bicycle, we're not thinking about how to ride it in words. We, we think in action and visualization. So, it seems like Thinking in language, eh, there's some support for linguistic determinism, but there's also some support uh, that refutes it. So it may not determine what we think about, but it probably does a, has a lot to do with how we think about things. So good luck. Uh, please review if necessary, and we'll, we'll talk about this in class and, and have you do a couple of activities to apply this information. Thanks.